Hello and welcome to Open Mic with Mike Balsam on Giant TV. Today we're talking a little bit about education. I have two very special guests in the Giant TV studio with me to my left. Amal Kayum, let's welcome her first. Amal, student at uh, West Lane Secondary School in Niagara Falls, and also, very impressively, a president of the Ontario <laughs> Student Trustees Association. Welcome, Amal. Thank you. And we're going to talk to you in just a few mo- moments about your role for the uh, provincial organization that uh, you belong to. Um, also in the studio to my right, Lisa Etienne is the president of District 22 of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. And and I have to be very, very upfront right off the top, okay? Because this, I, I have to be, I have to, I have to tell you that I do have a little bit of a vested interest. Um, most people, I think, that know me know me that my day job is as a teacher. So, of course, today's segment may come off as being a little bit biased, but, but I am going to say a few things about that. Um, in my life, I have never belonged to a political party. I have voted. In the past, for all three different political parties, and I can honestly say that, depending on where I've lived, which has been, uh, which has included St. Catharines, Welland, Fenwick, Niagara Falls, and Gananoque, and uh, you know, depending on who was running in those ridings, I voted for NDP, I voted for Conservative, I voted for Liberal. So I, I, I can honestly say that. Um, so this is a nonpartisan discussion about education, but certainly about what is happening in education in the next few months. So Amal, let's begin with you. You were in the news just last week as the president of the Ontario Student Trustees Association. You were up at Queen's Park. Tell me why you went there. Yeah, so I'm part of, like you said, the Ontario Student Trustees Association. Now that's a very long title, so we're also known as OSTA ECO. Um, So OSTA ECO, we are the largest student stakeholder group in Ontario. So we represent over 2 million students across the province both in the public and Catholic school system. So that's unique to us. And we work alongside the provincial government, actually with the provincial government, with other education stakeholders at the provincial level, making sure student voice is present at that level. Um, Our membership is made up of student trustees from across the province. So like you know, all boards are expected to have student trustees. These are elected officials who represent students at the individual school boards. And then we come together to form OSTA ECO. So Ostego, our biggest thing is consulting students, listening to students on all ends of our provinces, in the rural, in the urban, uh, large communities, small communities, French boards, English boards, public boards, Catholic boards. And so what we did, have done over the last two years especially, is really, really gone in there and consulted students on a variety of topics. So in the report that came out at Queen's Park on May 6th, it was titled uh, Oste Eco's Vision Document, the Student's Vision for Education. We had consulted over 20,000 students uh, for, in the formation of this document in a variety of areas. So everything from um, enhancing equity to school board governance to rural and northern education, student well-being, system modernization, things like that. We had asked students about their experiences, gotten this really raw feedback, and then we looked at the results to see where are we seeing common problems? Where are students saying commonly, I have an issue in this area? And we took those issues and made them into recommendations. So this report includes 35 recommendations and six key areas across education. So very comprehensive. And we were at Queen's Park to release the report. Can you describe some of those 35 key points? Yeah, so if we can start off with kind of enhancing equity. In the equity section, we looked at streaming. to say. So streaming, academic streaming is a huge part of our education system where starting in grade nine, students choose whether they're going to go with the university path or the college path. And then once they get to grade 11 and 12, sometimes branch off to this uh, straight to work path. And so we had asked students what they thought about streaming. And of course, there are students had said that they understand why it exists, but there's really huge, there's huge barriers in our streaming system. A little bit of stigma attached to some of those Lots, lots of stigma, exactly. And the most common stigmas are applied in college kids or the dumb kids and the kids going in those everyday courses are the dumb kids and then your university kids are smart ones. So it's stigma between students and it's also the expectations within these different streams. Now, although expectations will be different, different in applied and academic classes. It's again that stigma attached to it and we've students feel that the applied classes have gone a little bit too far in terms of not uh, motivating students anymore. Not putting those stringent expectations on them. Exactly. They're being let off too easy. And that's applied students saying that. They say, you know, I get labeled as an applied kid and then at that point people don't expect much from me. And so what we recommended is that the province uh, review our streaming mechanism because we also have 
huge discrepancies with a certain demograph over representation of sub- certain demographics within applied streams. And that's where the equity comes in as well, exactly. right? Exactly. That's a huge equity piece. Uh, I know the TDSB found huge discrepancies with uh, the amount of black students they had in applied classes. Uh, indigenous students, we see a lot of this discrepancies there. And so our recommendation is to review streaming to make sure this disc- those discrepancies aren't the reason students are being stuck in a certain stream. Because you have students who want to go to university, who want to go to college, but that stigma around it, um, lower achievement rates in those certain areas are what keeps students from achieving what they want. So that was one of our huge recommendations in terms of streaming. Now you mentioned two words, student voice. And the DSBN has just completed a project called Student Voice, collecting information from students. And tomorrow is a PD day um, as we're taping this. um, And we're going to be looking at that student voice tomorrow as staff members at the school at which I work. But I want to get right down to it. Do you feel that your student voice and the student voice of Asta Eko, do you feel that was heard by the current conservative government when they were releasing the budget and talking about the changes that they plan to implement for education? I think Asta Eko's job is to make sure student voice is heard, and that's why we're present. It's our job to make sure those provincial stakeholders are listening, and especially the government's listening. Um, so when, say, this, uh, for example, the e-learning announcement was made, uh, Asta Eko, through our student survey that we did last year, found that uh, student, 75% of students, when they rated the quality of an e-learning class in comparison to an in-person class on a scale from 1 to 5, 75% of students gave a rate between a 1 to 3. And that clearly tells us e-learning is not uh, providing the same experiences or the same opportunities as an in-person classroom. Um, and so when that e-learning mandate announcement came out, of course, we were very, very surprised. And what we're doing moving forward is that we've actually launched an e-learning survey. It's running until June 28th, asking students who have taken e-learning, who haven't taken e-learning about their thoughts and experiences. And we're going to bring forward that data and share it with the government. It's a very unbiased survey. We just want to gather student input. But if student input is that e-learning should not be mandated, it's not what we want to see right now. And also e-learning isn't ready to be mandated, then we only hope and will only uh, work very, very hard to make sure the government listens. Amal, are you 18 yet? Yes. So when did you turn 18? March 10th. March 10th. So Lisa, she's been 18 for two months, two and a half months. What do you think so far about Amal? I think she is exactly what's good about education right now. And it's... um, it's very important right now that uh, we showcase students like Amal and, and the other students that she's uh, speaking up for because that's what we're saying, that our, our current model of education is excellent. It doesn't mean you can't have improvements to it. It means that there's no point in acting like it's broken because it certainly isn't because we have many articulate students. And uh, well, I was at the uh, the protest rally in um, in Toronto at Queen's Park and the, the student voice led the, that led the rally. And... Nobody after that ever said anything that they didn't cover. Like they're they're articulate, they're smart, they know the, the issues, and uh, they're like I said, they're the best uh, advertisement we have for how great Ontario's education system is. Because I know you and I are of the same vintage, and I can tell you when we were in school, I don't remember any students being this strong, this articulate, Never. and this confident. We didn't like I can't I can even think back, and I was at Lakeport back when there was thirteen hundred students, and I, I still can't even you know even the valedictorian, even the president of student council. I don't remember any of the students having the confidence, the skills, and the presentation that um, the young people have today. So I really think uh, I think we're just it's just sad to hear that people are saying that there's something wrong with our system because I think our system's fantastic, and that doesn't mean it doesn't have room for improvement. There's always room for improvements, but um, taking um, investment out of education and taking um, educators out of the building is not going to help with, uh, you know, with students' preparation for the future because I think we need students that are very smart and that know what they're doing and have critical thinking skills and all of those things are just so important and that's what our, our system focuses on now, much more than when we were in school, even though right now the talk is of going back to basics, but I, you're going to go back to people of our generation. We we couldn't do what Amal does right now. Like no. we didn't have that. We didn't have those skills. So I think we've just done a great job of um, revamping our education system to meet the um, the needs right now. We have to have um, people who can problem solve and are critical thinkers and can uh, you know look at data, analyze it, and come up with a cohesive message based on the data they've gotten and the feedback. So I think it's just uh, like I said, that's my my concern right now with the way the things are going and the cuts. I don't think. 
there's anything wrong. I think we, there's always room for improvement, and, uh, but you very rarely improve things by taking people out of the building and taking choices away from students. Let's talk about the improvements that have been suggested by Doug Ford and Lisa Thompson, mm -hmm. the education minister. I mean, one of the things that they have spun as an improvement is adding six more people to the average class size. Right. And, uh, you know, as people involved in the education system, I think we fail to see how that can be an improvement to education. It's, it's impossible to see it as an improvement because it's not just about the six bodies in a class because anyone knows uh, the class dynamics are always different. You can have a very challenging class of of 19 and you can have a dream class of 34. It's not about the number, the thing is about the average number and the average number is only used to generate staff. There's no, uh, we probably have fewer classes in the system that are 22 or 28 at this point in time. There's, that's not the number of students in a room, it's the average that generates staff. And uh, so that's where you get into a problem. So even in just, even in the DSBN for example, moving forward over the next four years, it's going to limit it 150 teachers and that's not even starting on support staff because I don't have that data right now because that number isn't as clear because there's not a as obvious a generator for those kind of support positions but right now just for teachers and those 150 teachers are going to take 900 courses out the door with them and that's the the tragedy of all this because you you take 900 choices away from students we only have 17 secondary schools this is one or two classes that are going out the window this is 900 sections that aren't going to be offered and some of those classes are really important because uh, I remember one time, because being a math teacher, I remember um, uh, a colleague of mine took uh, some kids to a, you know, a demonstration uh, where at uh, a gaming company, and because you know that's the jobs and people in the computer class and everything. And they said what they couldn't, what they had a harder time finding, rather than the people who could code, their harder time was finding the people with the the creativity and the artistic means to come up with the ideas for those video games. So to think that you know we can just offer math and coding and that's going to get everything done no those even something as simple like that right. requires artistic it requires vision it requires the critical thinking it requires someone to have to be able to think the machine through. thinking has to go along with the and creative the, art, the artistic I mean, have you ever thinking. seen those games without the art without the music without everything it's all together and it's a package and that's what we're offering kids right now in this day and age we have a package of offerings and there's really good specialists at the secondary level and um, so some specialists don't have as many mandatory courses like I'd never be in danger as a math teacher but if you take you know like I said if you take 900 courses at a DSBN you are going to start having to make choices and some students in all sorts of different streams some students really want to take auto mechanics and some people really want to take hairstyling and others really want to take music and those don't offer as those aren't going to fill up like the math classes aren't easy to fill up so that's the real concern that you're going to be really robbing students of opportunities to uh, to grow and to um, learn and to just become better people and and have more idea of what they want to do one of the other announcements is mandatory online courses four of them being forced mm -hmm. on people now Amal you're a little bit different because you're telling me that you've you're finishing up right now your third online course yeah. it works for you it works for me because I'm away from school a lot and and that's the thing I'm not taking e-learning because I necessarily like it I think the online platform you prefer to be in the classroom to be in the with classroom. a teacher that you can talk to and exactly. ask questions exactly of. I'm, I'm taking kind of the social science stream and social science is all about those seminars and those conversations and those debates and I'm so right now I have like a law class in school but then I'm taking my families in Canada online the experience is unmatchable. I, I don't think I've learned from my families in Canada. I've figured out what's expected from me, and I've figured out how to get the grade I need to get into university and to keep my scholarships, and that's what I do. My law class, though, I, I might be away for the whole morning, but I show up to fifth period so I can participate in whatever's happening because I love that class. I have so much fun with it. Um, so I'm not taking e-learning, like I said, because I like it. It's because I miss a lot of school, and it, it's what's working for me right now. I've never taught an e-learning course. I've tried to help some students through mm -hmm. an e-learning course. In my experience uh, as an accounting teacher, for instance, students that have taken my grade 11 accounting in class, they turn around the next year, they'll take my grade 12 accounting online, and most of them don't finish. No. They get about halfway through and they realize that they don't have the skills 
to pace themselves through this course. They don't have the skills to learn independently. They don't enjoy the experience of trying to contact the teacher who's offering that e-learning course, who may not even be in that board, because I know this for a fact. Uh, right now, uh, we have two students, a couple of different students, taking accounting online at the school at which I teach, mm -hmm. and they're taking the, the courses from two different boards. Yep. So they're not even in the same board with yep. their e-learning course. Is that something that you've heard from fellow students as well? That's actually what kind of the norm is, depending on where you are and what course you want to take. So my family's in Canada is actually my third choice in course. I wanted to take a politics course and then I want to take an economics course. Those are my first two choices. My politics course, if I remember correctly, was Renfrew County. And then my economics course was Ottawa Carleton. So two boards that are about a six hour drive from us. So it's very rare that you take them in uh, for within your own board. And I think with the e-learning, it's not only a students don't enjoy it. it. If you look at the students who are taking an e-learning course, it's a lot more of the students who have their own computer. I, I just talked to someone about this this morning. The reason I've been able to take e-learning personally, I have my own laptop. My school Wi-Fi isn't reliable, so I hotspot my data every morning and I use my own hotspot so I can do my work. That's not an option, especially within the Niagara region when we see poverty rates rising. Exactly, yeah. That, and even just within Ontario, that you can't expect people to have their own thousand dollar computer and their own hotspots because Wi-Fi isn't reliable, regardless of how much we like to disagree with that. Um, you can't do an online class on your phone or on an iPad. You need a computer because of D2L just isn't compatible uh, with cell phones uh, the same way it is with a computer and the same thing with an iPad. So we don't have the infrastructure in place to mandate that. And D2L, for those watching, that is the platform that is most commonly being used across Ontario to deliver e-learning courses that stand exactly. for desire to learn. Yes. Again, you know, you bring up an excellent point, and I think people assume, and I think governments assume, that we're all connected and we all have access to a computer, to Wi-Fi, yep. to a subscription to, uh, you know, to internet services. But there's a lot of people that are still struggling to afford that, Lisa. Tons. No, yeah, it's... Definitely. Poverty is always... And that's the ironic part of all of this, is all of these cuts, not just to education, but all of the cuts certainly disadvantage those who are already disadvantaged. And that is, that is the shame in all of this. It's... Um, the same kids that are coming to school hungry and the same kids that don't have Wi-Fi and the same things. And that's, those are the, the, the students that need the social workers. Those are the students that need the caring adults in the room. And those are the students that need the opportunities to see how they can grow and what they can become. And uh, it's like I said, so they're not being just hammered that way. Their families are being hammered by other kids at the same time. And uh, it's just the, the whole thing is just kind of sad right now for me. It's interesting to me, and I can throw this out to both of you, that the last five years in the schools, especially in the high schools, there's been a huge focus on mental health. That's what the focus has been. A lot of the um, you know, PD day training for teachers is, is about supporting student mental health. And, and it's something that as teachers, we love to do. And, and we really do care about our students. But by throwing that many more people into a classroom, where would teachers find the time to support that mental health aspect for students i don't think you do and you, like we were talking about earlier so we put out that report uh, at queen's park last week one of the testimonials uh within so we had students provide testimonials to a couple of different topics and we talked about class sizes in the report and we had a student write in to us and say i was in grade 10 and it was a longer testimonial we only put part of it in but they had said i was in a grade 10 academic math class and in my school, we call kind of grade 10 math the turning point of math, because that's when real high school math begins. Exactly. Um, so they were in this grade 10 academic math class with 35 students. Um, they were an academic student within all of their other courses, averaging about a 90% 90, 90 average. So this student was succeeding. In this math class, they didn't receive the one-on-one -on -one support they needed. They were failing and decided rather than fail this course and not be able to move on and succeed, they switched to an applied class uh, but what that did is closed off some post-secondary pathways for them. And the student talks about how they went through, you know, the first unit of this grade 10 academic math class and their mental health was suffering because they felt dumb. They felt stupid because they couldn't understand what was being taught to them. And their teacher just simply did not have the time to help this student because he, and because as a teacher, you have to prioritize at this point, what, what are you going to do and how much time can you put forth in one class? This student was able to receive that help. And again, they switched to an applied math class. And that's and that's kind of the best case scenario. What happens to those kids who 
are in a grade nine, a grade 10 applied math class, what are they switching to? There's no other kind of level of math at that point in grade 10. Uh, so it's definitely a huge concern. At least as a math teacher in your career, uh, maybe you can attest to, you know, how bigger class sizes may have limited you in the past to help students. Yeah, I think it's, it goes beyond just the ability to, you know, if you want to carve up the day into how many minutes per kid, that's one thing. But I think it just goes into the whole dynamics of the classroom. It's, uh, you need, again, in this day and age, we're not all just sitting in rows doing worksheets. That's not how we teach anymore. And that's not how people learn anymore. So you do have, you, you do need to be able to set up systems where, where students are working together, where there's some collaboration, but you also have to be uh, conscious of that. Then everyone can work in a room that's like chaotic and loud either. So it's a fine balance. And you also need to have lots of times for discussions. I mean, it's a little bit different in math, but in certainly other classes, the really important part, and that's why online learning isn't good, is because you don't have the discussion. I, I took a course once. I, I Again, I uh, forced you. I couldn't take it uh, in person. I signed up twice, and it got canceled, so I had to go online. And it's the, it's the conversations in class that you miss. And that's what I found when I was doing the online learning. I had to, um, like you said, you learn how to pass. So I had to go online and I had to make so many comments for somebody's thing. And, and I had to do quota. That. So I had yeah. a quota for comments. So I did that, but there was no, but then I'd done it and that checked off the list. It wasn't a conversation. And you learn from interacting, like that's the thing. So. Um, that's what I find in the class. So it's not just the, it's not just the whole, you know, oh, what do you mean there's six more kids? Well, six more kids, to be honest with you, translates to 36 students in a year for a teacher because they teach six courses. So 36 students is more than 28, which is the new huge class size. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, this is more than a, an entire class. It's actually a 27% increase in the student load. So it's not just about, oh, what do you mean you can't, you know, spare five minutes for the student? No, you have a 27% increase in your workload. It's like teaching a one and a half extra classes from what you already did at the 22 to one ratio. So it's, uh, so it's just the, it's the managing of that. And then there's the marking and also to the parent contact, because that's another important component. And there's a lot of data about that, that um, parents that stay engaged in their child's learning also have more successful students. And so the parents are staying engaged, which is good. But now again, times have changed. And rather than just parent teacher night or the odd phone call, you have email. You have all sorts of ways of contact. That's right. So now this teacher is also going to have another 36 parents to contact every year. And so it's that whole piece of the whole relationship building, you, the building the relationship in, in your classroom. So the fewer students, the better relationship building you have. And the, being able to build a relationship with the whole school team because you also need time on your um, on your prep page, you need to um, talk to other colleagues. You need to talk to the social worker. You need to talk to the student success team. There's a lot, there's you know there's a lot of adults in the building that that are working on this, and then you need to um, communicate with parents. So you can say it's. Um, you know, we're worried about the course selection being taken away from the students, but it, it, the workload issue has to be, you know, it, it is part of it as well because you can only do so much. It, once you get thrown in a whole extra class and a half into your day, into your, into your school year, it's a lot of work to do and it's a lot of communication. And I think the students also suffer from that and the parents do because I think the parents really want to be engaged in their students' learning and they want to know what's going on and they want to have that communication. Back to talking about math, when announcing mm. these changes to education, there was a lot of talk about math scores being poor, and oh, I, I think there's been some kick ba uh, pushing back against that. So yes, can you explain that? And, and again, that is, I, I, I did not, we didn't set this up because I couldn't tell you how happy I am with that because it's not true. Our EQO scores are going up. Math um, is going, is better. It's on an upward trend. And not only that, um, especially, again, you can take all the stats you want and everything, but like, let's just look at our school board. And, and the reason I want to look at our school board is because it shows how when you invest in something, what you can get back. And our school board is pretty unique. Um, when they had some concerns about some of the, the math results, what they did with, there's called um, additional qualification courses that teachers can take. And our board, and they should cost about $700 to $800 a course, and you do them in your own time. And a lot of teachers take them and because they always want to learn but this one was the the board actually offered um, math aq courses parts one two and three and they ended up with in dsbn alone they ended up with over a thousand teachers taking these courses and they funded it and our scores are way better than they kept because they invested in it it wasn't about taking money out and and it's not about basics because i know you know 
certain demographic says, oh, it's terrible, kids can't make change if you give them a $5 bill. That's not a skill that anyone needs anymore. The, the, the cash register can do that. They yeah. need to think way, way beyond that right now. And so right now our, um, in DSBN, because of this investment, not withdrawing funds, not withdrawing expertise, but investing in people, is uh, we have a 15% increase above the provincial average in, in grade six, in grade three. We have 12% above grade average in grade six. And... Um, Again, our, our academic, 84% um, of the students are, are, you know, working above average. So it's, it, our numbers are great because we've been investing in it and everyone's been taking the time to become better. Because giving teachers a math test is, is such a, it's, it's, again, it's all the distractions that are going on by this government. It's the bucket beer, it's the license plates, it's the nickels falling out of the gas can. It's all of those things. But the math test isn't going to make anyone a better teacher. Um, you know, you want a good teacher, so you want someone who's grade two. They don't need to know how to do differential calculus. A teacher in grade two knows that has to know about child development. And they've gone to university for six years That's to right. learn about childhood development and about learning and about strategies. So giving that person a, a calculus test and saying that you're making math instruction in the province better is a complete, it's a red herring again. To, to, to justify taking money out or and to justify the revamp and then like I said and I'll just one more thing you know you, then you put in a um, a former um, government MP, MP uh, in at the head of EQAO well as a math teacher, I can tell you how easy it is to put in a new curriculum, change the person making up the test, put different questions on it, and hope the scores are going to go up or down or however you want. Do you know what I mean? So with EQO has always been at arm's length before now, and um, the people running that had no uh, connections whatsoever to the, to the, the government, government of the day, and uh, the scores have been increasing steadily in Niagara because we've been steadily putting in more money and investing more into our teachers and investing more into students. I, I want to wrap some things up pretty soon, but I'm going to ask you, Lisa, one more question, mm -hmm. and then Amal, I'll, I'll come back to you. But Lisa, contracts are up across mm -hmm. the province yes, at the end of August, and right now things don't seem positive uh, as far as I think what the public's perception will be to the talks between the government and the school boards, or I shouldn't say the school boards, but the, the teachers' unions. Because uh, there's two tiers of bargaining. So the first yeah. set, set of bargaining happens at the provincial level with the um, public school boards association, the government, and the unions. And I can tell you, um, the secondary teachers, they uh, gave notice to bargain the first bit data available. They're ready to go to the table. We already have all our meetings. Our positions are very reasonable, and they're already in place. We've already And uh, they've had one meeting with the government. There's two more scheduled. We're... Um, working hard to get things solved before september and that's our goal we, our goal is never disruption that's never anyone's goal um sometimes it's happened because you're trying you, you need to use leverage to get uh, to where you think is best for the system but um I, i'm anticipating it's going to be a difficult round but i hope it's uh i hope the government comes to the table serious and with the intent to bargain um in good faith because we're ready to go and we've had everything in place and we're uh, like i said meetings are happening already, even though the contract isn't over until the end of August. Amal, last question for you. I'm going to quote the article uh, in which you were featured in the Toronto Star. Um, your quote, a quote from you, says there's gaps between the government's education priorities and those of your organization. Can you explain? I think this gap has uh, existed even before, say, this government came in, even with the previous governments. I think what we, and this is why student trustees and student voice is so essential. Oftentimes we come up with these new initiatives, new curriculum, whatever it may be, meant to maximize student success. We think it'll do great things, and then we let it come into play, and we realize it's not fulfilling its purpose. Students aren't responding to it. It's actually hurting students rather than um, helping them. And that's what we see a lot. And again, that's why student voice is so important. Um, I think in relation to the new changes right now, that's what we expect e-learning to be. Um, although there there have been some arguments about why the government thinks that e-learning should take place. And Austin has never said that e-learning is not a good thing. It's been a great alternative course for students who need to take it. Like myself, we have rural students who want to take those specialized courses that just aren't offered at your school. Can, can you imagine yourself putting in as much effort as you have to OSTA without being able to take those e-learning courses to keep up with your studies during this time? Um, I think my grades would have suffered, personally. Right. I think I, I think I still would have been able to get through it. I think my grades would have suffered without right. e-learning. So I, that's why. It's still essential. You still need it. There's students we know who deal with mental health issues, mental health concerns, and so they can't be, say, in a traditional classroom. They use e-learning instead. However, mandating it province-wide 
that's where student voice is coming in. We've seen this over the past couple of months with these student walkouts, things like that. Students really speaking up. Students saying, that's the gap. There's a gap in our education system with people saying, the government saying, that's a good thing. Students saying it's not for several reasons. Um, and so we definitely see those gaps in a variety of areas. It's not just that. We still see it with curriculum because um, like uh, you mentioned, we have a great education system. It's one of the best in the world. There's always room for improvements. And that's exactly what this report's here to do. And students are the most honest people you'll meet when it comes to their education system. They're always ready to tell you about their experiences. Um, one thing I did at the beginning of my role, I talked to seven students who had graduated uh, from different boards across Ontario, all on different life paths. And we asked them, what do you wish your education system taught you? Or what do you think was missing? Great feedback. And that's what they said. What what schools are trying to teach us and what we actually need, there's a gap. There's a gap between what provincial governments are coming down with, what we need. It's not, the ends aren't meeting, the stars aren't aligning. And that's where we need to start really listening to students and using using that as a guide, I think. Not only using student voice, because I think it becomes a catchphrase. And to me, I don't like saying the word student voice anymore on itself, because it's a catchphrase yeah. across the province, across Canada right now. Let's stop making a catchphrase, make it a reality, make it the norm. And that's, and so when we're doing like, uh, cross uh, judicial scans and we're doing uh, evidence-based research, student voice needs to be right in there, student input needs to be right in there and valued the exact same. Amal, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I do want to say that both of these two guests today will be moving on in the near future. Yeah. Amal graduating from West Lane Secondary School in uh, a month and a half's time from uh, when we're taping this. Uh, hopefully on to either Western or University of Toronto in international relations and business. So uh, good luck to you. Thank you. And um, I'm sure Lisa Etienne will join me in um, telling you how impressed we are with you. And uh, Lisa and I both brought in notes, Amal has got no papers in front of her, no papers in front of her. And uh, Lisa, how many years have you been teaching? 29. 29 years. So after 29 years, Lisa will be hanging up her chalk. Chalk. I, I don't know what else to say. And your hitting chalk, the trails your, with your the chalk Rooster brush? Club. Yeah. Hanging <laughs> the chalk brush and pulling out the, the hiking boots. So yes. heading into retirement yes. and uh, we thank you for your service thank and you. uh, good luck to you. Thank you very You've much. been watching Open Mic on Giant TV. Thanks for watching.